Welcome to the Nonprofit Report for 2021, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we will talk about the civil rights movement in America with guests. Um, <laughs> um, Tiffany English, um, director of the Civil Rights Memorial Center at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Kevin Jennings, CEO of Lambda Legal and Dorian Spence, Director of the Special Litigation and Advocacy uh, at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. I'm sorry for mangling this. I will get better as we go on in the year. And a reminder to Zoom attendees, we will take three snap polls during the show and we'll announce results and questions submitted through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen will be included in our discussions. I'd like to thank you all for joining. Um, it's, it's just wonderful to be talking with three such wonderful leaders for such wonderful organizations. Let's start with the uh, uh, Civil Rights Memorial Center at the Southern Poverty Law Center. You memorialize the great work of the Southern Poverty Law Center and also the civil rights leaders of different eras. Could you talk uh, about your uh, background and your own view of your work in this field? Thank you so much, Mark. I'm so glad that you led with um, the Civil Rights Memorial and the Civil Rights Memorial Center, because every time I'm on a platform, I have to start there at that memorial, which memorializes 40 individuals who had um, significant involvement in the civil rights movement. Um, the memorial was designed by Maya Lynn, and it actually inscribed events and individuals central to the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. Um, it memorializes individuals like Reverend George Lee, who was a pastor in Mississippi, who used his platform to galvanize um, individuals uh, to go out and fight for their right to vote. Medgar Evers, Rosa Parks, Emmett Till, and also Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who on yesterday, um, the nation honored his um, life and legacy through a national holiday. And I always start there because without those inscribed on their memorial, there would be no Southern Poverty Law Center. The Civil Rights Memorial Center is a project of Southern Poverty Law Center that was formed in 1971 and actually formed in response to the need for lawyers to litigate cases in the South because there were very few attorneys who were willing to take on civil rights cases. And um, the nation knew as well as individuals in the South that after the Supreme Court ushered in um, an array of federal laws that the South would, uh, it would be met with resistance. And so the Southern Poverty Law Center was founded in 1971. Um, this year, we are celebrating 50 years. Later this year, 50 years um, since the founding of Southern Poverty Law Center. And today, um, we still remain a catalyst for racial justice in the South and beyond. And we do that through our educational programs, which is our teaching tolerance department, um, the Civil Rights Memorial Center. We do that through combating hate and extremism under the umbrella of the intelligence project and litigation. And our uh, impact litigation has expanded. And so our legal practice groups include children's rights, immigrant justice, LGBTQ rights, our economic justice department, um, criminal justice reform, and more recently, voting rights. And so we do that work um, through a multi-pronged approach, which is also what they did uh, in the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s. You know, Tiffany, it, it, I, I really wanted to start with that historic perspective because these rights must be explored and celebrated to inform the next generations. If you look at what Lambda Legal has done, Lambda Legal was built on two pillars at least, right? Outrage, outrage for the treatment of people of, of different orientations, genders, and, 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 uh, and sensibilities under the law, and the history that was forged by leaders um, that you celebrate. Kevin, could you talk about the forming of, of uh, Lambda Legal by Bill Tom and how the organization have, has evolved since? Because you have become increasingly sophisticated in your fight. 
You know, first of all, thank you, Mark, for organizing this panel. And, and let me say uh, thank you to Tophany and to Dorian for uh, the work you do and the important organizations you represent. Um, the, the LGBT rights movement basically was inspired and drew on the blueprint created by the civil rights movement, right. quite literally. Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund took its incorporation papers and literally copied them word from word from the incorporation papers of the Puerto Rican Legal Rights and Defense and Education Fund. We literally took their incorporation papers and hit, this is before you could hit replace all, but basically hit replace all and put in Lambda Legal Defense and Education Fund. And we were actually rejected by the state of New York for charitable status in 1973 because the state of New York said we had no legitimate charitable purpose in existing. And our very, by the way, one of the perils of working from home is that you sometimes have furry <laughs> guests who decide they'd like to offer their point of view in panels as well. Um, and um, Lambda Legal had to be its own first client because in 1973, the idea of and a, a litigation organization dedicated to the rights of LGBTQ people was considered so ludicrous that we couldn't even get charitable status. So we had to be our own first client. Um, and I think that um, to younger people, I'm, I'm gonna go out on a limb here, Mark, uh, and uh, you don't have to out yourself, but I'm betting at almost age 58, I'm the oldest person on the call. Um, you know, I can't help but reflect on how different the world was when Lambda Legal was created um, and how different the world was. You know, Martin Luther King would be 92 if he was still alive, if he had not been murdered. That's really not that old, quite honestly. There's lots of 92 year olds walking around still today. By the Frank, Anne Frank would be 92 if she was still alive. There's lots of 92 year olds walking around today. And I often say that I'm one of the youngest people who can still remember segregation because in Forsyth County, North Carolina, where I grew up, schools were still segregated when I started first grade. It wasn't until second grade when busting began that schools were desegregated in a meaningful way in Forsyth County, North Carolina. Um, and that was in uh, 1970. That same year, my brother, who was white, married my sister-in-law, who is black, um, and I have to remind people that that had only been legal in the state of North Carolina for three years at that point. The, in and the laws that, that really formed the U.S. Uh, foundation for uh, segregation, such laws were, were adopted by the Nazis as the Nuremberg Laws and eventually um, by the apartheid regime in post-48 uh, as their uh, various laws. And Dorian, you've been fighting this battle for a while and your organization also has these deep roots in this, this struggle for justice for all Americans. Why should one American be treated differently from, from all other Americans? Yeah, that's, that's correct, Mark. And first of all, um, echoing my, my co-panelists, thanks for putting together this platform. Uh, Kevin, I, I actually went to law school in Forsyth County at, uh, at Wake Forest. Uh, so I spent some time in Winston-Salem as well. But yes, that's correct. Uh, the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights was is a um, racial justice organization founded in, in 1963 at the request of uh, President John Kennedy and in the East Room of the White House. And um, he called 220 of the nation's leading uh, lawyers and, and challenged them to, to get the private bar involved in the fight for civil rights. As my... Um, co-panelist of Ms. English said that there were problems in finding lawyers to take on some of these litigation cases in fighting for civil rights. And that's what the role of the Lawyers Committee has been. It's been a challenge to the private bar to dedicate their time and their resources to the fight for racial justice and civil rights. Here, um, 58 years later, uh, we find ourselves operating at almost every front on every aspect of racial justice, whether it be uh, voting rights or criminal justice, education discrimination, economic justice, fair housing, um, uh, public policy, um, instances of hate, or in, in my uh, world, in my project, I work on fast developing cutting edge civil rights issues that are intersectional, 
um, that have reared their ugly heads over the past couple of years during this uh, most previous administration. And as we stand on the cusp of welcoming in a new administration tomorrow, we know that these cutting edge civil rights issues are not going to go away. Um, so in many respects, uh, the racial justice practice has been one that has been ever expanding into stepping outside of the view of just the lens of just race first and African-American people. But we've also taken on fights on behalf of, of black immigrants, right? On behalf of Native American populations or Latino populations. So, you know, the Lawyers Committee has been around for a very long time. Uh, we operate in, in a ton of different spaces, uh, but we know that uh, the, the fight is far from over um, and, and we're nowhere near done fighting. The thing that I think is so interesting is uh, the fact that um, if you look at, at uh, the cohort of attorneys in the United States, it is still 80% uh, plus white. Um, and so legal education is also a piece of this. How do we, um, we ensure that together um, we create a cohort within the courts, within the justice systems, with, you know, amongst attorneys and so on, that have different sensibilities that map to the needs of the nation. Um, one of the big issues is uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion that, that we, we've all been talking about, but, but institutions, systems have a tough time enacting. How do you see this, Kevin? How do you, how do you change the complexion and the makeup of those who administer the legal system so that they are thinking very proactively about issues that, that actually affect them personally because they are the ones who are targeted by injustice. Um, well, people are policy as the old saying goes um, and who you put on the bench has a huge impact. Lambda Legal has been doing each year during the Trump administration a judicial nominations report. And our final report basically showed that Trump has literally whitewashed the bench. Over 80% of his nominees to the bench were white men. Um, and that's going to have a devastating impact because these are lifelong appointments. So we need, first of all, to have a judicial bench that reflects America uh, and does not skew itself towards white men like me, frankly, because um, that represents a very limited aspect of the American experience. And you keep doing what you're doing, you're gonna keep getting what you're getting, which is a justice system that is skewed towards heterosexual white men. Um, and if you keep beating those people on the bench, you're gonna keep getting those results. Uh, I think the other thing that Lambda Legal did, which I'm very, very proud of was we sued to block the executive order Trump put in place that would have forbidden the use of federal dollars to train people on the existence of systemic racism. Um, and we were successful in getting that um, executive order blocked on December 23rd. The reality is, is that this country needs to, first of all, face and own its history. And it needs to take affirmative steps to change who is sitting in seats of power. Uh, uh, until it does those two things, nothing is ever going to change. I, I think that's such a great, great point, Kevin, is that you have to be informed by, by history, right? And then you have to look at how do you change a system? It's not just one thing. It's not just the lawsuits, but it is also um, how you approach the whole question of justice. Uh, Taffany, do you feel that, that, that you've got the same uh, issue that we had in, in the past in many respects. I mean, part of the history of civil rights is about um, black people in this country, people of color, uh, uh, Latin Hispanic people, uh, Puerto Ricans, um, Jews and so on, uh, fighting within a system that is stacked against them. Right, no, I, um, we're definitely still in that place where we're seeing the um, injustices from a systemic um, standpoint, but I do want to um, just add on to something that Kevin was saying um, about the Trump administration and the whitewashing of the benches. And I think it's very important that we do talk about policy, but we also talk about educating voters on the local level, because that is where we will see impact. Um, and this is also where um, 
we will see things transform on a local level that would then inform on a national level. I'm a native Alabamian. I grew up in the South, black girl raised in the South. And one of the things that I've always just had a passion for even was like, I am going to change the political landscape of the South. We've always been represented by, represented by white men who have no interest in the black and brown community nor um, issues of poverty. Um, when it comes to the South. And so I think um, what we're seeing from organizations is this shift um, from talking about things from a broad perspective and focusing in on what our constituents and local communities are in need of. There's a saying from the disability community and I, I, I contribute them with this is um, nothing about us without us. And we have to have, um, we have to center the voices of individuals with this. And I, and I, I want to plug this. Um, Southern Poverty Law Center um, outlined uh, a forward-looking progressive action uh, uh, report, and it's a vision for a just future. And so uh, that was a compilation of listening to constituents. That was a compilation of listening to uh, staff members about what those issues are from those who are on the ground, working on the ground in um, close contact with our community. And so if we are really going to change systemic racism, that, that structural racism that creates disparities, whether it's wealth, um, housing justice, um, we know uh, the Trump administration rolled back the affirmatively fair housing rule. And if we wanna talk about wealth, we have to eradicate poverty. We have to look at instances of criminal justice reform. And that includes also looking at our mental health system um, and where individuals with mental health in issues are not criminalized. And so, you know, when we look at systemic racism, it is very much tied to, um, I think when people, they want to hear the comfortable quotes with Dr. King, right? But prior to his assassination, he was very much talking about poverty, um, he was talking about education, he was talking about policing, he was talking about housing, and he was talking about inequities um, in pay. And so, um, again, you know, he's offered us a living model, a living legacy, and we just have to transform and we have to be adamant about that as organizations. Uh, I also want to remind our listening audience that um, that we will try to answer any questions you might have or make any points you, you think uh, should be made. Uh, just to report back on polls, um, in terms of, of our poll on uh, where we prioritize civil rights, 26% uh, of respondents said that our top priority should be civil rights in America, and 67, an additional 67 felt that it was one of the top three and the balance thought that it was one of the top 10 priorities. So th there is a, a huge consciousness surrounding this. And then our second poll was interesting. What is your primary source of news on the modern civil rights movement today? And we found that print journalism and op-eds was the primary um, uh, um, source of respondents as well as TV news, but social media and chat groups, um, while, while there were some people, um, very little workplace, very little, and late night talk shows, very little. Just a very interesting uh, little tidbit because if we're going to unify people, we have to talk with each other. We have to actually work through these issues. Dorian, when when you look at your work here as uh, to advance uh, civil rights, what makes the the work today uh, fundamentally different? Because there's a lot about it that is the same, right? You're still uh, bringing cases in court that connect to justice. But we can't keep cycling using the same approaches with the same arguments, with the, with the same imbalanced system, um, and, and, and still expect success. Are there changes that have been taking place in the last five or 10 years that are scaled to today's world as opposed to our traditional view of this matter? Sure, um, absolutely. But before I jump to that, I want to touch on something that Kevin said just briefly in response to a question that you asked, um, just about diversifying, uh, I guess, the people who are holding the keys to the kingdom when we talk about access to justice. Um, you know, one thing that we say often uh, in the lawyers committee space is that um, diversity, 
and things like justice and things like access don't just happen by accident. You have to be intentional about creating these spaces or diversifying these spaces. So when you talk about the bench specifically, or the 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 um, the 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 practice of law broadly, or even diversifying law schools, um, a lot of that doesn't happen unless you create a pipeline of of people who can fill those seats and diversify those spaces, right? Um, you know, Kevin talked about the whitewashing of the bench uh, with the uh, 200 plus federal um, appointees or federal judgeship appointees that that uh, President Trump made. That was a an intentional move. It was an intentional step to whitewash the bench. So you have to be equally as intentional about diversifying those spaces as well. Um, so I, I just wanted to touch on that briefly. As far as um, what makes today's movement or the fight for justice fundamentally different. I would say um, that, and I say this with great risk, but I, but I believe it that over the past year, we're, we're, we've entered into a, a, a space where America has set up and listened to some of the cries of activists or activist organizations like Black Lives Matter. They haven't changed much, but it seems like we have their ear, specifically in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery back last March. Now, there were some marginal changes um, that happened at the very granular level on the municipality, on the municipal level. Not much happened in the um, federal space, but we, we've seen some, some, um, some movement um, in response to the activist uh, movements of Black Lives Matter and other organizations. Of course, you know, in, in, the, in the practice of law, um, we're dealing with the interpretation of, of um, and oftentimes the negative interpretation of, of uh, statutes that were designed and developed to protect the civil rights of Black and Brown people and um, other traditionally marginalized groups, right? Um, I think in the digital age that we live in, in the consumption of the news cycle that we live in as well, uh, the reaction to injustice and what happens in real time is a lot faster than what happened uh, or than uh, the reaction that happened during the civil rights movement where the news cycle wasn't a 24 hour news cycle. So in many ways, it's easier to get people to take to the streets and use their first amendment rights to call for justice and they know very quickly, whose door to knock on down at City Hall, whether it be a city council person, a county commissioner, a city mayor, or a county executive, when something goes wrong in their communities. So I think the access points are fundamentally different than what we saw back in the, in the 60s and the 70s. What I do think is the exact same, though, is that you still have the fire um, inside of frontline activists and the fire inside of um, people who play the background. <laughs> like myself, um, and litigators, whether we be grassroots or grass tops, community lawyers or otherwise, a pro bono support um, into to moving this country towards justice. Um, we just received uh, a question, very interesting. It sort of it sort of takes off on on the themes that you raised. How do we engage compassionately and open openly with people on the grassroots uh, level um, who rely heavily on social media? How do we ensure that the messages get out there? and that they are having effects uh, because that is where so much of the action is. And Dorian, you were talking about grassroots, grass tops. Right. Aren't we all part of this struggle? Aren't we all, it doesn't matter if we have, you know, a law degree, Kevin, right? It doesn't really matter if, if, if we're in the camera picture, we are all in the camera picture through our, through our devices, aren't we? I think so. Um, and I would say yes, actually, but how do we engage in a way that we make sure that the message is getting out there. And I'll speak specifically through my lens as someone who practices for a national civil rights organization that oftentimes partners with pro bono law firms to, to move us towards justice. Um, the one way that we engage to make sure that the message is being out there or is, is being pushed out there is to not co-opt the message, right? To walk humbly with community, right? And make sure that what their advocacy points are, we do our role oftentimes in the background of supporting what they actually want, as opposed to taking what they say they want and putting it through our lens as lawyers. Are you, saying, are you saying both act, but also listen? And Absolutely. try to really deal with, you know, you're not going to find everybody agreeing with you, right, Kevin? I mean, 
uh, Taffany, I, how, do, how do we deal with this? Because we have issues there. We have issues, uh, you know, anti-LGBTQ, people who think out of a religious view or a personal view that, 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 that uh, they, have, they have a view that uh, ends up marginalizing people in that community. We have um, uh, racists and uh, people who just feel that, you know, things are fine the way they have been. How do we listen to those people in a way that gets them engaged? Or do we just sue them into oblivion? No, I, I, I do agree with um, Dorian that um, it, it, we have to be intentional. I think he used the word intentional. And um, where organizations like SPLC and, and the other organizations um, on this panel have used litigation as a tool, um, we've all acknowledged that it's not the only tool. And the civil rights movement, the civil rights movement was a multi-pronged approach then, and it's the same today. I think we can look at Georgia as a model, not just Georgia, but the same thing ha happened in Louisiana and Mississippi, where you had grassroots organizations on the ground in communities talking to individuals about what their issues were um, and also providing education. Not only were they providing education, they were providing resources. For instance, um, we had Tamika Atkins, who's the executive director of Pro-Georgia on a panel on Friday. And she talked about one of the things that they were doing um, in the midst of this pandemic, when they were out trying to educate voters, they um, had a partnership where someone um, provided laptops and books for students who were having to uh, you know, have school virtually. But now they provided them laptops so that they could um, get the word out, they could do the calling, they could do the emails and et cetera. But they also acknowledged that a lot of the individuals in their communities didn't have broadband, broadband access, didn't have the uh, MacBooks, the Chromebooks or whatever it is. And they said, yeah, so this is what this is for, but we also realize that there's a need for your child to be educated, right? And so that is one of the things that they did. And I think organizations also have to look at where they fit in, right? We can't be the answer to all. And um, one of the things that Southern Poverty Law Center did um, was they had this voting rights initiative where they funded grassroots organizations on the ground to expand their work. We didn't come in and say, hey, we're SPLC, uh, we're providing these grants, and so this is the model that you need to follow. They realized that most of those organizations were limited in their financing, limited in individuals to assist, and so, they said, this is where SPLC can help, right? We have this grant initiative and this is where, and then, you know, forming a coalition of organizations throughout these communities. Again, I have to go back to the whole thing, nothing about us without us. And so you have various organizations in communities working in different aspects, providing different direct services. And so they know the needs of their people. So why not form an umbrella, a coalition of organizations who can put those resources together? And I'll say this in my, in concluding, um, Dr. Bernice King uh, did an interview with us um, in honor of her father's birthday. And one of the things she talked about was there was this need for a unified approach. And you do that through coalition building in your communities. So we're going to give uh, Kevin a word and then Dorian will have the last word. Um, but I, I think that what, what you're saying is so important. We are the powerful, right? We can listen with compassion. We can respect without acceding to a, a viewpoint that we do not uh, feel is right for America. We can continue to fight. We can give a laptop. We can give an hour. We can spend some time. We can try and convince, right, Kevin? I mean, really, it's it, the power is in us. We can just take action, can't we? Absolutely. I think that we need to make a distinction, though, between communities and organizations. Um, I think that there are a lot of folks out in the community who we can have dialogue with. I don't think we can have dialogue with groups like the ADF who are on the SPLC hate list. 
And those people are very determined to roll back our rights. And they have allies now on the Supreme Court, like Amy Coney Barrett, who is, let me scare you to death. If she lives as long as Ruth Bader Ginsburg, we'll still be handing down rulings from the Supreme Court bench in 2059. We have many, many decades of fights still ahead of us. And that's why I'm so grateful for having allies like Taffany and Dorian in this fight, because my assistant today texted me. He said, it's the last day. Uh, and I said, last day of what? And he said, the last day of Donald Trump. Uh, and I said that, yes, that's very exciting, but we have uh, decades of fighting the, this whitewashed bench to come. Uh, and the work that the three organizations represented on this call do in the courts is just beginning. It's the end of the beginning of our work, not the beginning of the end. We just uh, completed a poll, which was very interesting. We talked about how people can contribute to the fight for justice and in, in, in civil rights. And we had the maximum, uh, most respondents uh, talked about voting. And then there were other things, donating, uh, joining protests, making career choices based in civil rights and so on. Um, it, as we move forward, Dorian, uh, with you having the last word, um, how should we do this? Because my biggest concern, my biggest concern is the people who oppose my own worldview. My own worldview is, is an, of an American that is very diverse and respectful of others and um, does things through the electoral process and through the criminal justice system and then comes together. That's, that, that's sort of my, my view. Um, a, a place of justice and discussion and debate. There are people who don't agree with aspects of, of my view that need to be listened to. Um, now that doesn't mean that someone who comes at me violently, I'm going to um, allow that to happen. Um, and it doesn't mean that somebody who opposes me, I do not oppose in return. But how do we bring this country together, Dorian? <laughs> That's, that's a heavy question to, to end on. Um, touching on something that, that Kevin said, I, I don't think that there's space for dialogue with someone who opposes my, my existence as a human or thinks I deserve less access to justice or equality as enshrined in the constitution as, as they do. Um, but I do know that one thing that marginalized communities have always been on the front end of is fighting to hold the constitution accountable for exactly what it says, whether it be in the space of voting or fair housing or, um, or equal justice for all um, or first amendment rights, right? The people who have taken to the streets to fight for those kinds of rights have been the marginalized community, whether it be black or brown or LGBTQIA or what have you. Um, so I, I think that marginalized communities and, and people who are justice minded have always understood that the constitution and this country or the tenets of justice that this country was founded on don't just exist um, on autopilot. They don't just happen because uh, they're written on a piece of paper. Um, they, they, exist, they exist because people fight for them and, and hold them to account and push to exercise those rights sometimes on a daily basis in an occupied zone for, for months in, in Oregon or um, in the street for weeks in, in Washington, D.C. Um, and we do so with the fundamental belief that, that justice and, and the sun comes out in the morning and the, the day is going to be brighter uh, the next day. And even if it's if we're going through dark times right now, uh, tomorrow will be better, because if we don't have that level of hope and that expectation um, that in the end, the country will do the right thing and is on the right track to uphold the ideals and the in the um, tenets outlined in this nation's constitution, then what are we fighting for, right? So I, I think that um, for us who, who have the expectation that we will be better one day, is that we continue to do uh, what we've always been doing is that, in, in, in that is uh, fighting to, to hold this nation accountable. And if you're not in the space of racial justice or LGBTQIA rights or immigrant rights or, or civil rights or what have you, you do what you can where you are. If you are at a pro bono firm, um, donate some of those pro bono hours to fighting for a cause that you believe strongly in. If you can't do that, um, donate to your local chapter of the NAACP or 100 Black Men or what, whatever civic-minded 
organization um, is in your wheelhouse or serve as a poll worker or a poll watcher or what have you. But there's more that can be done across the board to making this uh, nation um, just and equitable for all of its citizens and not just some. So the answer is service, service. The answer is not violence, it's struggle. Absolutely. Right? The answer is, is not walking away, but taking it on in all absolutely. these different ways. Yeah, no, absolutely. And that, that's a very simple way, of, uh, a, a short way of saying what I said the long way is, is dedicate yourself to service and be on the front lines of making this country what it's supposed to be. Well, this has been a wonderful discussion. Taffany English, uh, Director of the Civil Rights Memorial Center of the Southern Poverty Law Center. Kevin Jennings, CEO of Lambda Legal. Dorian Spence, Director of Special Litigation and Advocacy at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under the Law. Thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us, for sharing your insights with us, for your great work. Let's all, let's all rededicate ourselves. And remember, we are all part of the struggle. We all have the power to assert our sensibility and to help this nation be what it should be. Thank you so much. That's the Nonprofit Report. See you on Thursday. We'll be talking about uh, Na uh, Native American art and artists. Um, and, and everyone be safe in this uh, crazy COVID time.